coming up today. Korea's National Assembly Speaker is set to meet with the rival parties on two major bills. He might decide to invoke his authority to bring them to a floor vote if no compromise is reached. Korea's exports plunged by their sharpest margin in five years in January, weighed down by slow global economic growth and record low oil prices. Plus, as the WHO prepares to hold an emergency meeting, researchers say the Zika virus linked to severe birth defects may have reached Indonesia. Stay tuned for these stories and more. Hello, it's noon on Monday, the 1st of February. You're tuned in to our midday newscast here on Ali Dang TV. Thank you for joining us. I'm Mark Broom. And we start with efforts to end the gridlock in South Korea's parliament. The Speaker of the National Assembly is set to meet representatives from Korea's main parties to encourage them to reach a deal and approve some long pending bills. Jong Yoo Ha has indicated that if the parties can't compromise, he might exercise his right to force a vote. Shin Se Min starts us off. With Korea's rival political parties continuing to disagree on contentious bills and the cancellation of the pre-scheduled plenary session on Friday, the Assembly Speaker is looking to do his part to speed up the process. Speaker Chung Hwa expressed Monday morning his intent to have representatives of the rival parties meet in the afternoon, where he is expected to discuss ways to handle the bills. Following the last-minute cancellation of the plenary session, Chung hinted he might exercise his authority to put the bills to a floor vote, something that he had previously been unwilling to do. Currently, the main opposition Minju Party of Korea is placing priority on redrawing the country's electoral map over the corporate revitalization bill or one-shot bill aimed at reducing legal procedures for businesses. The ruling Senate party, however, is urging the assembly speaker to use his authority to bring two of the pending bills on economic revitalization and North Korean human rights to vote without bipartisan consent. Friday's plenary session was canceled as the main opposition camp boycotted the session after failing to narrow differences with the ruling bloc over a clause in the North Korea human rights bill. Concern is now mounting over whether the rival political blocs will be able to table the bills on revitalization and North Korean civil rights for a vote before the provisional session ends on February 7th. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. Now, Korea's economic team has called on lawmakers to swiftly pass pending structural reform bills in a bid to prop up the feeble recovery momentum here in Korea. Joined by other economy-related ministers and the head of the Financial Services Commission, Finance Minister Yu Il-ho said Monday that the bills are critical to the creation of jobs, especially for Korea's younger generation. Minister Yu expressed concerns over sluggish job growth in the first quarter of this year as the government's extra budget laid out last year to boost growth uh, is starting to lose steam. He added that the government will soon come up with new measures to boost domestic demand and exports. Korea's foreign ministry has offered some possible reasons as to why Japan insists uh, it did not coerce women into sexual slavery during World War II. Speaking to reporters on Monday, ministry officials said women who were forced uh, to be sex slaves for the Japanese military were often tricked under the guise of employment or that the Japanese uh, may have destroyed documents stating women were coerced into sexual servitude. Now, Seoul confirmed on Sunday that Japan submitted a report to a UN agency denying that its military coerced women into sexual slavery during the Second World War. Historians say there is a great amount of evidence to show that Japan did coerce women into sexual slavery. In late December, South Korea and Japan reached a landmark deal in which Tokyo took responsibility and formally apologized to the elderly survivors. Now, Korea's exports, once the main pillar of the economy, are continuing to lose steam. After falling every single month last year, outbound shipments fell yet again in January 
and did so by a large amount. Kim min -ji has the details. Yet another big fall. According to the Trade Ministry, Korea's exports fell over 18 percent in January compared to the same month last year to stand at 36.7 billion U.S. dollars. It marks a 13th straight month of decline and the biggest yearly drop in more than six years when exports fell 21 percent. By region, outbound shipments to the European Union rose 7 percent, while shipments to the U.S. fell 9.2 percent and to China 21.5 percent. The ministry attributed the decline to fewer working days, slow global economic growth, especially in China, falling oil prices, as well as a drop in export prices. Imports fell more than 20 percent to $31.4 billion during the same period. Last month's trade surplus came to $5.3 billion, extending the surplus streak for a 48th straight month. The news, however, isn't all positive, as the surpluses have mainly been driven by a sharp decrease in imports rather than an increase in exports. Kim min -ji, Arirang News. Now, staying with economic news, and last year was another bullish 12-month period for Korea in terms of its current account surplus. The country's central bank says the surplus exceeded 100 billion U.S. dollars for the first time ever in 2015. Now, the figure is up 25 percent from the 84 billion posted in the previous year. The Bank of Korea attributes the rise to falling oil prices that caused imports to fall uh, at an even faster pace than exports, as our Minji just mentioned in that previous report. Outbound shipments dropped over 10 percent, while imports plunged 18 percent. The price of Dubai crude, which Korea uses as its benchmark, was nearly halved last year from 2014. On the basis of volume, though, not the dollar value, exports of goods actually rose 2.5 percent, while imports went up 3.3 percent. Korea ranked 14th worldwide in terms of stock market capitalization last year. According to the Korea Exchange, the uh, combined market cap of Korea's listed firms reached 1.2 trillion US dollars as of the end of last year, making up 1.96% of the global market, almost 2%. While this is a 1.5% increase from the previous year, Korea's global standing remains unchanged. In 14th, in 2015, the combined global stock market shrank 1.1% on year to $62.8 trillion. This is due mainly to a fall in European, Middle Eastern and African stock markets. The United States took the top two spots with the New York Stock Exchange and the Nasdaq, followed by Japan's stock market. Now, we reported on Saturday on the discovery of a fake bomb and a threatening note at Korea's biggest airport. Local authorities assume it's more likely to be the work of a prankster rather than any uh, actual terror group. But investigators have stepped up their probe to find out who did it. Ahan Dayan with the details. Police have released a picture of the note found over the weekend in a men's bathroom at Incheon International Airport. The threat, which was printed, not handwritten, reads, This is the last warning to you. Allah will punish. Officers assume the message was typed by a person with some Arabic skills who might have been learning the language for some time, as it showed only minor grammatical mistakes. Authorities will take the note to an institution that specializes in Arabic for an appraisal. They plan to analyze the unidentified suspect's Arabic skills and their personal characteristics through the appraisal. Officers are scouring some 80 surveillance cameras installed on the first floor of the airport's passenger terminal, but they have yet to find any decisive evidence. They say the bathroom in question is located far away from the cameras, making it difficult for investigators to identify people's faces or movements. Officers are also analyzing 19 fingerprints collected at the scene. And then, I did a news. A fresh case of Zika has been found in Indonesia, but researchers say they believe the virus has actually been circulating in that country for a while. An Indonesian research institute says a 27-year-old man living on Sumatra Island who had never traveled overseas had been found to be infected. Researchers say they don't know how and when the man contracted the virus. 
The World Health Organization, which will hold an emergency meeting on Zika on Monday, has warned the virus is spreading explosively in the, in the Americas, with up to 4 million cases expected this year. The Zika virus is suspected to cause grave brain damage in newborns if it infects pregnant women. Countries throughout tropical Southeast Asia are bracing themselves for an outbreak, with Malaysia saying Zika could spread quickly if introduced. Now, the building you can see behind me, the Lotte World Tower in Seoul, is expected to set a new record for apartment prices in Korea. According to Lotte Corporation officials, residential and office spaces in the 123-storey building will be up for sale starting in the second half of this year. The price tag for the 220 apartments is set to be the highest in Korea at around 66000 to 83000 US dollars a pyong, or 3.3 square metres. Lotte Group Chairman Shin Dong-bin is set to purchase the top two floors of residential space in a private capacity and not as head of the group. He'll have some view up there. Shin's father and founder of the group, Shin Gyok Ho, will use one of the private office floors for business and living purposes. The building is slated to be completed at the end of this year. The death toll in a series of bomb blasts in Syria has risen sharply. Three bombs exploded in quick succession outside Syria's holiest Shiite shrine. The so-called Islamic State group has claimed responsibility for the blasts. Officials say the attacks were clearly aimed at disrupting peace talks currently underway in Geneva. Kim Yok Young has the details. At least 60 people have been killed and more than 100 injured in a series of coordinated bomb attacks in southern Syria. Syrian state media says three bombs exploded on Sunday near a revered Shiite shrine outside the capital Damascus. The first blast was caused by a car bomb that detonated at a bus station near the shrine. Two suicide bombers then blew themselves up when people gathered at the scene. The group that calls itself Islamic State has claimed responsibility for the attacks. The bombings come as members of the Syrian government and the opposition gather in Geneva for peace talks. Syria's main opposition group, Higher Negotiation Committee, and UN mediator Stefan de Mistura were scheduled to hold a bilateral meeting on Monday. However, it's looking increasingly likely the talks will be called off amid the turmoil caused by the bombings. UN Secretary General Ban Ki moon has urged all sides to put the interests of Syrians above their own. The civilians, including children and women, have been bearing the brunt of this conflict. We must urgently see an end to the fighting, the siege, and the other terrible human rights abuses that have characterized this war. More than a quarter of a million people have died and 11 million have fled their homes since the civil war erupted in Syria nearly five years ago. Kim mok Arirang News. Now, it has emerged that more than 10,000 young refugees arriving in Europe over the past two years have been reported missing. The EU's police intelligence unit, uh, Europol, says thousands of children have disappeared after registering as refugees in European countries. It said around 5,000 are missing in Italy alone, while more than 1,000 have disappeared after arriving in Sweden. Europol warned that some children and young people have become the target of forced sexual exploitation and slavery by criminal gangs. However, the head of Europol says there's also the possibility that some have returned to their families. Save the Children says some 26,000 child migrants entered Europe last year by themselves. Now, we hope, of course, that it never happens, but uh, when we find ourselves in a dangerous situation, perhaps a life or death situation, we need to find help as soon as possible. But uh, often we're left with just two choices, screaming for help at the top of our lungs or yelling out, save me, or something along those lines. But as it turns out, uh, one is much more effective in grabbing people's attention than the other. Our Park Se-young with the details. After hearing the scream, we immediately know that the woman in the movie is in danger. According to a McGill University research team, the human brain registers the emotions in a person's scream in just 0.1 seconds. In fact, people focus more when they hear someone scream than when they actually hear the word, save me. Researchers say this can be traced back to evolution. 
Human beings made emotional sounds for survival way before languages, which is why the brain responds much quicker to the former than the latter. In another experiment, the researchers recorded simple sounds expressing happiness, sadness, and anger and presented them to 24 participants. They found that people respond fastest to sounds of happiness and showed the longest reaction to sounds caused by anger. The research team interpreted this as part of the brain's defense mechanism to potentially dangerous situations of anger. The results were published in the scientific journal Biological Psychology. Park Se-young, Arirang News. Now, we've made it out of January, but the cold weather is sticking around in Korea on this first day of February. Seoul saw the mercury dip to a frosty minus 9 degrees Celsius overnight, and it won't get that much warmer either, with the daytime high only reaching minus uh, 2 degrees. And with the wind chill, it'll feel even colder. Now, these cold temperatures are being caused by a high-pressure system over northern China, which is bringing Siberian winds to Korea's central region. Northern Gyeongsangbuk-do, northern Gyeonggi-do, all of Kangwon-do and north Chungcheong-Bukdo provinces are under cold wave warnings today. The good news is, though, while it might be very cold, the sun is out and the air is pretty clean with fine dust levels nationwide at normal. Well, that's all we have for now on this Monday lunchtime here in Seoul. I'm Mark Broom. Thank you as always for watching. We hope your week gets off to a great start. We'll be back throughout the day with more newscasts. Until then, goodbye.